Richie, you have watched people in brain scan scanning machines as they are practicing mindfulness. What's going on in the brain? Well, uh, lots of things are going on, and it, uh, it's not something that we can summarize easily for a few reasons. One is it depends on whether it's a person who's just starting out to do this, or we bring in someone who's done 35,000 hours of lifetime practice. Uh, what, what that person shows and what a novice shows may be quite different. Uh, it will differ as a function of, even though um, what I think John said is, is, is really important, uh, in terms of what we measure in the brain, uh, if you are using your breath as an object of focus versus using an external visual stimulus, there'll be somewhat different parts yeah. of the brain that are involved. The one thing we could say is that networks that are important for attention are engaged by these practices, uh, and we can say in certain ways strengthened. Which parts of the brain are activated? Well, uh, particularly the uh, regions in the prefrontal cortex, which play a very important role in aspects of attention. Um, but again, it depends upon a person's level of expertise. We've seen in very expert practitioners that um, the prefrontal cortex comes online for very brief periods of time, but then uh, goes back down to baseline, and it, it corresponds, we think, to reports that these practitioners give of being able to rest in awareness in the way John was describing it completely effortlessly. Uh, it, they don't need to, uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of effortful way, yank the mind back because it is just um, more, that space, if you will, is more familiar. And the word meditation, by the way, in Sanskrit, one of the definitions literally means familiarization. And it is a person becoming more and more familiar with uh, this quality of awareness that John was talking about. Now, I know you have uh, put, uh, asked uh, very experienced meditators, particularly Buddhist monks, to come into your lab and you have watched them. And sometimes these are people who have spent literally tens of thousands of hours meditating over the course of their lives. What have you seen in these? I think you've described them as sort of like the the Olympic athletes of meditation. Uh, what have you noticed in them? Well, uh, in that work, uh, we, first of all, we see very different patterns with different kinds of meditation practice. So uh, uh, we've been talking about mindfulness. Uh, there are many varieties of mindfulness practice that these um, folks engage in. And there are also practices that are designed to explicitly cultivate certain kinds of um, positive qualities like compassion and loving kindness. Um, and uh, we see differences depending upon what practices that they're doing. One of the things that we noticed early on when people are doing a basic uh, mindfulness practice, particularly the kind that John described where they're not choosing a specific object but just resting in awareness in these long-term practitioners is they exhibit a um, an oscillation in the brain that we call gamma oscillations, particularly in the prefrontal region, but we see it across widespread regions of the brain. These gamma oscillations uh, are high-frequency oscillations that are recorded with brain electrical measurement. Uh, they are oscillations of about 40 cycles per second, and they've been implicated in basic neuroscientific research in synaptic plasticity, in basic mechanisms of plasticity. Uh, one of the things that we see is that these oscillations are highly synchronized across widespread regions of the brain. We also see that um, when an external stimulus is presented, these oscillations become phase-locked to the external stimulus. And what that means, it best describes as a me in a metaphorical way, uh, if um, you can imagine a very, very still lake uh, and you throw a stone in the lake, uh, you'll be able to easily see the ripples that that stone will produce, even if you're standing on the other shore of the lake. Whereas if the lake is turbulent, um, throwing the stone in, you, you won't see any, any effect. Uh, if the mind is turbulent, uh, when you introduce an external stimulus, it's going to be part of this turbulent gamish that is the stuff of our mind. But if the mind is more quiet, you'll see this kind of 
phase locking where an external stimulus will lock uh, onto a phase of the ongoing brain oscillations and uh, that may be a way in which the brain can enhance, if you will, the signal to noise ratio largely by decreasing the noise, not so much enhancing the signal.